Okay, hello everyone, and thank you very much for coming to this webinar on open education. Does it work for eye care educators and learners? My name's Sally Porsley. Um, I'm the technical lead on the Open Education Program at the International Centre for Eye Health, and I'm hosting this session today. So uh, before we get started, I just have a little bit of housekeeping information. Um, we're going to hear our two. Oh, if I can just. There we go. We're going to hear our um, two present presentations first. They're each about uh, 10 to 15 minutes, so it'll take about uh, half an hour in total. And then we're going to have a short uh, Q&A session for the last 15 minutes. So um, during the talks, please send in your questions using the question box on the webinar menu tab, and I'll collate them and ask them to these questions to our two presenters. Uh, you can download the presentations from the handout section of the webinar menu tab. This will open up if you open up the menu options by clicking on the orange arrow on the tab. Um, and that's also where you uh, see the, uh, the chat menu where you can ask the question. The question uh, menu where you can ask us questions. And finally, we are recording this session and I will be sharing a link to the video and also to a tra transcript um, in a few days' time. Okay, so let's get started. This is the second in a series of five monthly webinars that we are hosting at the International Centre for Eye Health. And the aim of the webinars is to explore how we, as eye health educators, can use digital technologies, the internet, and this concept of open education to innovate and improve our practice, and address some of the really big challenges that we know are currently facing eye care training around the world. You know, issues such as the need for more trained professionals to deliver universal eye health, and the lack of and maldistribution of faculty and resources. So uh, the, we looked in these issues in some detail in our first webinar um, in January, and if you missed it and are interested to see it, you can view it and download it from our web page. If I just go back, there's the link there, ich.lshtm.ac.oer webinars. And um, you can download this presentation to get hold of the link. Okay, so today we're going to move on from looking at that big picture about open education and the need for innovation in eye care training to look at some of the evidence that research has been finding about the impact of open education activities um, on learners and educators, um, the benefits and the challenges. So we're going to hear from our very own Dr. Daksha Patel about the experiences here in, in our Open Education for Eye Health program. And we're really delighted um, that we've also have Dr. Rob Farrow from the Open University, who is going to talk about the work of the um, Open Education Research Hub, OER Hub, and summarize some of the really interesting results they've found in a recent OER impact research study. So thank you for joining us, Rob. So before we get started, um, I just wanted to summarize uh, what we understand as open education. It's a little bit of jargon. So um, we thought this would be a use, uh, useful thing to go through just ahead of the two presentations. So in essence, um, we can define open education um, as activity aimed at reducing barriers to participation in education and learning, you know, by reducing the cost of education or by reaching learners at a distance or by removing the need for prior qualifications to access a course. Open education is not a new idea, so for example, the public library movement of the 19th century, such as this Andrew Carnegie Library um, from Trinidad that um, is showing on the screen, it gave uh, many working people access to printed information for the first time. Radio and TV have been used for many years to give health information talks, and even the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina um, engaged in open education by allowing entry to anyone with a secondary school degree since the early uh, 20th century. So open education often use, makes use of technology, but it's also about cultural issues, as you can see from those examples, you know, about empowering learners or improving the equity of educational provision. So with rising access to digital technologies and the internet, the focus of a lot of open education activity has moved to online and digital. And that's what kind of what we're looking at today in terms of impact. Open online courses, such as at the, the ones we're developing at ICH, and open educational resources, which Rob is going to talk about. Now, these can be defined as uh, digital materials, which anyone can download, use, change, and then share again for free, and without asking for permission from, the, from whoever originally published the material. 
And this is done through a special copyright license, often um, which I'm sorry, which is often Creative Commons. That's the most popular one, and that's the one we use. Okay, so I've kind of raced through the definitions of open education. I hope that's helpful for you in, in our two talks. And I hope you can start to see how we feel as proponents of open education, that it can play a significant role in shaping how we address the issues that are facing education globally today. Okay. So now I'm going to hand over to Daksha. Um, those of you who are new to the International Center for Eye Health, um, uh, might not know that she's our e-learning director and she's been with us for many years. Uh, firstly, as our director of uh, our MSc in Community Eye Health for more than 14 years, where she heard about the frustrations and challenges that more than 300 students from all over the world were experiencing in their own settings around eye care training and learning. Before that, Daksha was actually an ophthalmologist in Kenya for nearly 10 years. And latterly, since 2014, she's been our director of e-learning and has been grasping uh, funding opportunities to develop e-learning and open education at ICH. Thank you, Sally. And thank you for the overview on what we sort of covered on open education last week. So building on from that, uh, I thought what we'd do is discuss very briefly the relevance of open education, particularly for eye care. And what have we learned so far from the experiences that we've had since we started to dabble in open education? And then looking forward to where can open education in eye care be used to support curriculum, curriculum development, uh, development of uh, uh, learning resources, and also keeping in mind that at all points, we want to ensure that there is quality uh, in the content that we produce. So from that perspective, I take you back to this slide that we had last time, uh, looking at the uh, magnitude of visual impairment, which is 285 million people. But as you can see from this rather distorted map, that if we go by this, uh, where are these blind people? and visually impaired people, we find that they are the, the countries that are shown in rather swollen um, perspective is where they are um, mostly, that's where the, the uh, visually impaired people are. Whereas you can see within the Americas and in Europe that these have shrunk down quite a lot from its, its actual size because the numbers of visual impairment is less. So you can see uneven distribution of the burden of visual impairment across the world. Now compare this with this image. And this is uh, an image that's showing uh, how is public health spending that is taking place around the world. And then it's a complete opposite picture. So the money that is being spent would now give the Americas, particularly the United States, it's much more uh, enlarged, and they have a large budget for spending in public health, similar to Europe. And when you look at Africa and India and even China, and even to some extent within the, the islands around the, the Pacific, you find that the funding is almost non-existent in those settings. So as a result of this, we are finding, particularly in eye care, that the distribution of ophthalmologists per million population is, again, so varied, where you find places around many parts of Africa where you can have less than one, one ophthalmologist per million population compared to many parts within uh, Russia where you have over 100 ophthalmologists per million population. And this disparity in the distribution of health providers is further seen in this mapping survey that we carried out across 20 African countries. And what we found that, of course, what's uh, immediately obvious is that there is no one CADA that provides the service, but there's a range of different CADAs. And again, their distribution is so varied between urban and rural regions of the countries. 
So we are faced with a range of challenges. We have a wide range of practitioners and wide range of teams that provide services. A large number of them work in isolated remote settings and these are often the allied eye health workers. Across the board, what we had found was that the clinicians double up as trainers and the resources they have are very limited. And when you look at what continuing medical education is, it's often deprioritized when looked at the clinical activities that need to be conducted. Looking at the curriculum that these practitioners are trained with, they are mostly clinically driven, that is looking and focused at, on the one patient uh, in front of them, which is correct, but at the same time we feel there is an urgent need to also look at the public eye health approach. And at present there is limited or no resources in that at local level. It certainly lacks trained faculty and there are, overall there is very few resources available to people to use to teach public eye health. So coming from that perspective, we asked ourselves about three years ago, can open education work for eye care? And what we did look and know that we had is that we wanted the content to be purposive and practical for a wide range of practitioners in the field. We knew that the content had to focus on key conditions that can be used to manage avoidable causes of visual impairment, which is like cataract and refractive error. And the technology that we chose to use was online. And open education gave us that added extra to allow us to share, adapt, particularly to localize the knowledge where it was needed. How did we go about doing this? Well, we were funding, funded by Seeing is Believing, uh, a standard charter project, and we were able to develop a six-week online course. We pilot tested that course in three countries, in Kenya, Ghana, and Botswana, and across a wide range of practitioners from ophthalmologists, optometrists, clinical officers, ophthalmic nurses, and even uh, refractionists. So we took what was known to us, which is our face-to-face -face content that we had tried and tested and used for many years. We took 60 hours of that content. We redeveloped it to have an open online course made up um, from that, of course, with the Creative Commons license, and then shared it with our partners in these three countries. And we took a bit of learning from that. And all this was funded through these uh, bodies along with the London School. What we then did was we created the content with this online and used the specific elements on planning and managing for cataract and refractive services. So making it very specific. And we delivered it to all these cadres within these settings. Each of our country facilitators was then um, a key partner in making sure that the content was uh, made available to the right people in the right locations. We did a pre and post course survey and a follow up one year later on what was happening. What we found with the 88 participants that we enrolled in these three countries for our pilot project, we found 83%, this was their first online course experience, we were very encouraged that 64% actually completed this course, 32% completed more than half of this course, and only about 4% were unable to start the course. When looking back on the postcode survey, it was only one person who actually felt that by participating uh, that this was not a good uh, experience for them. So we were very encouraged by that strong agreement on good learning experience. We followed up a year later to see and define very closely 
what were the key characteristics of some of our completers. And we looked and developed some case studies around that. And very often we found that many of these practitioners were based in remote settings. They were completely challenged by both internet and electricity access. And they worked at weekends and at night to do the course. They used a variety of tools, which is 3Gs and smartphones. And the reason why they did it was they felt it was a very important source of information for themselves and to share. And they used the content to apply it to their practice, which is to understand local cataract backlog, plan service to increase their cataract surgical rate, and to address patient barriers. So they were very specific on how they used this course. The partial completers had a very similar profile, but they were very strategic learners. They only downloaded what they wanted, and they could go back to use it as, as they re re required. Their challenge was their workload. Their clinical workload set them back, and personal motivation and time management issues were raised as major concerns. Our course facilitators in each of these countries felt that this was a great way to move forward and actually felt it was a great way to involve people in remote places. And the relevance was that it was applicable at the practical level. And huge numbers wanted to participate, but what we had only done was a pilot. So we then went on to develop this course as a MOOC on the FutureLearn platform and eventually had over 5,000 people who joined. A large number of them were active learners. Many of them were from low and middle income countries. And this for us has been very encouraging and we are at present running our third uh, run of the MOOC uh, this year. The key takeaways from the follow-up of the people that participate on our courses has been that the materials were useful, they could be adapted, it has changed their attitudes towards empowering patients, it developed specific school screening programs for visual impairment, and are now monitoring their cataract surgical rate. So what has done we are often trapped within this conventional relationship in education, and this is not just specific for African universities. This can be found across a wide range of settings that people come to one institution to get the knowledge they require. What we are wanting to do is, if we can, with open education, replace that with a networked relationship and make the sharing of knowledge easier and practice improves what through the sharing of that knowledge. There's a lot of potential from, for open education, whereby we can take this generic content that we've created and, of course, enable it for reuse, adapt it for local settings, increase its accessibility, so through online, but also through other technologies. And this includes downloading it onto USBs but also embedding it into curriculum. And this process has already begun for us. We are now working with three partners, again, in Africa, in Nigeria, in Kenya, and in, at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. What they're doing is they're taking the course that we've got, they're localizing that content using the Creative Commons license, they're adapting it for, again, an online version for that local setting, but also using that content to facilitate and support the teaching that's taking place within their classrooms. And they're providing it accreditation. So what this is giving us now is that we've got a framework within which we're looking at the course through this Creative Commons license to give us products, platforms, partnerships, policies, and promotions to make sure that we've got relevant content selection, our experts are contributing it and therefore providing quality. Partnerships with educators are ensuring that it's going to become relevant for the users. Increasing digital literacy, and this webinar is part of that package that we're developing. Um, 
the adaptation by those experts at a local level and aligning them with their local curriculum. And this is where we feel that there is lots of quality measures that allow us to keep improving and embedding the course in a practical manner. So in conclusion, there's a growing demand for knowledge delivered outside the classroom. Open education is driv driven by the Creative Commons license and its use, reuse, adapt and share are its key strengths. And certainly this has allowed us to shift the balance a little bit and there's a lot of ownership of learning, particularly as people are taking on and embracing self-directed and self-paced learning. We believe the content has a lot of merit in how it's been selected. The completion as a marker is, in, is insufficient. We believe that there would be strategic users of the course who would use what they want. And, and that is also uh, uh, practical for their own settings. Our key interest is to maintain quality for the resource and ensuring this quality is through experts and use of peers. So in summary, I think we're, we're expanding our open education program to involve a lot more different subject areas over the next few years. So we certainly believe that if we've lit the candle, there will be others who can take the light and share them in other places. So thank you very much for this opportunity and for listening. Thank you so much, Dacha. I think one of the key things for me from your talk was how learners and educators are empowered in some ways to take control of their, their own self-directed learning. Um, okay, so I am just going to... Um, I, we're now going to hand over to Rob. Um, so I'm just going to introduce Rob to you. So he, and he's going to present on what the research um, into OER impact has been finding um, through this OER research hub. So Rob is a philosopher, interdisciplinary researcher, and educational technologist. Uh, as a research fellow at the Institute of Education Technology at the Open University here in the UK, he's been involved in a range of projects, allowing him to develop expertise in accessibility, evaluation, mobile learning, and the use of technology to support research communities, and most recently, open education. Um, Rob is a key member of the Open Education Research Hub, which is leading research into the impact of open educational resources on teaching and learning practices. And in the OER Research Hub, he's built a strong personal network through collaboration, working with a range of key stakeholders to research non-formal and institutional use of OER. He's also acted as a research consultant for the ROR I never pronounced this right, the ROER4D project, which is based at the University of Cape Town in South Africa, and which is looking into the impact of OER use in the global south. And he's also worked for the Open Knowledge Foundation. Um, his research interests are wide-ranging, gravitating mostly around communication and ethics in policy formation, decision-making, knowledge transmission, and teaching and learning. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Rob. I'm going to now switch over control to you. If I can just find you. There we go. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank, and thanks for the invitation to come and speak with you today. Um, what I was going to do was basically give you a kind of overview of some of the work that we've been doing over the last few years and um, include a kind of, um, I suppose, some of the findings that will maybe offer some context to the data discussed in the previous presentation. So uh, if you're on Twitter, uh, you might want to follow the project. It's OER underscore hub. Uh, we're a team of uh, five at the Institute of Educational Technology at the Open University. Um, again, we're all there on Twitter individually as well. If you want to connect with us, that's a good way to do it. So um, we've been doing quite a lot of stuff over the last few years. <clears throat> and uh, I suppose it's fair to say I could, I could speak for a lot longer about the, some of the findings that we've had. Um, one way to just give you a, an overview is to think about uh, stuff we've done over the last uh, sort of six years. Um, 
starting in 2012 when uh, OER Research Hub was first uh, constituted as a, as a project through to the work that we're doing at the moment. So to start off with, um, I'm just going to talk about uh, the first three years, if, if you like, was the sort of core uh, impact research stuff for OER Research Hub. So um, we worked in collaboration in this project with uh, lots of people who were involved in um, producing and using open educational resources. <clears throat> and in our collaboration model, we had four sectors of focus. So higher education, schools, what they call K-12 in the USA, uh, community colleges or further education, uh, and informal or non-formal learning. And um, when we were funded to do this work, the, um, there was a lot of talk uh, around the potential of OER to uh, transform education and widen participation and so on. Um, so in, our, in this project, we looked at 11 hypotheses, each one um, designed to focus in on the evidence base for these particular claims um, about the potential of OER. Uh, so we built quite a big set of data. This was a global project. We had um, more than 20 surveys, did more than 60 interviews, various focus groups, collected impact statements, and so on. Um, I'll go and talk about a bit more about this data towards the end. And you can see here that we had, um, I think it was about 180 countries uh, represented as part of that data set but predominantly um, based in the USA, because that was where the focus for the uh, work was. That's where the funder was based, and that's where a lot of our collaboration, our collaboration partners were based. Um, the data that came out of that um, part of the work we did um, was mapped, and um, we did some data visualization with some of it as well. Um, if you want to check any of that out, it's OER Impact Map. We also took some of that um, uh, survey data and um, made an experimental tool so that others could use it. So rather than just releasing the data set openly, we also um, create a tool for people to explore the, the data themselves. Um, if you want to read the reports themselves, um, they're available for free on our website. Um, the evidence report summarizes for each hypothesis. Um, I'll talk a bit about some of the findings from this at the end of this presentation. So uh, we had a change of focus. So rather than being purely focused on um, research into OER, which is open educational resources, uh, we widened that focus to include um, other aspects of open education, such as um, MOOC and open educational practices and so on. Um, but inc increasingly, we've also taken on a kind of um, uh, research capacity building role and a leadership role in this area. There's actually still a quite a new area, um, open education, um, and methods for doing research into something like what's the impact of adopting OER um, are not established. So there's quite a lot of um, experimental and exploratory work going on around this. Um, so under our new kind of uh, aspect as OER Hub, we have this broader focus. I'll just tell you a little bit about some of the projects that we've got going on at the moment. Um, the BizMOOC project is an EU-funded project um, which is focused on the potential of um, MOOC for um, learning about business and learning the kind of skills that are useful in business across Europe. The Explorer project um, is about producing an open online course to train teachers in the practicalities of OER reuse. Uh, we also run the uh, GoGN, which is the Global OER Graduate Network, which is a network of PhD students involved in research projects around the implementation and evaluation of um, OER in educational institutions. Um, building this network is um, quite an, an interesting um, aspect of what we're doing at the moment. Um, we're aspiring to get, um, I think, about 100 people uh, as part of that network. At the moment, we have 45. Um, you can see here that they're, they come from a, a range of different countries. We had our first alumni. Um, starting to come through now. Um, this work, as well as um, the OER Research Hub work, was funded by the Hewlett Foundation, who um, really take, take a lead in um, supporting OER research and OER programs around the world. We also have the Opening Educational Practices in Scotland project. Um, this is um, about collecting evidence around the, the way that people use um, OER uh, in practice. 
um, and thinking about um, you know some of the assumptions that we make about what people actually do with with OER. Um, we also have the OER World Map Project, so this this kind of develops some of the earlier mapping work that we've done. Um, the idea here is to create a database of um, OER activity around the world. So one of the kind of um, criticisms people make of open educational resources is that they can be hard to find, hard to find good quality um, resources in the area that you need. So um, part of the approach here is to create a better way of indexing and a better information architecture about the resources themselves. Um, but it's also about putting um, people in touch with each other and um, supporting the development of communities um, around open educational resources. Um, another piece of work which you might be interested in, which we did um, doing, did last year, still being written up, is to have an ongoing kind of consultation with um, the open education community really about what the next step should be, how um, best to organize and what to areas to prioritize research in. We just launched a survey uh, today for a new project, um, UFAT, which is Open Online Flexible and Technology Enhanced uh, Models. Um, this is uh, collecting examples of best practice uh, for sustainable business models in open education. Um, you can uh, read, if you like, this uh, textbook we've produced on um, the process of open research and how to sort of become an open researcher. Um, this is another aspect of the work that we've been doing. Um, but just to give you a flavor of some of the um, sort of headlines, if you like, coming out of um, some of this work. Um, going back to this uh, data set that I mentioned before, there are some things that we can say which I think uh, echo some of the findings that Daksha was talking about. Um, so when we asked people, um, including both educators and students uh, in institutions, which we're call, calling formal learners here, 37% um, of educators said using OER improves student satisfaction, uh, and more than half of formal learners agreed with that. Uh, we had about a quarter of educators and about a third of former learners say that uh, OER use um, results in better test scores. It's difficult to triangulate that data because it's quite hard to get institutions to share something like um, pass and failure rates for their students. Um, but it's a finding found consistently um, across lots of different surveys. Um, another area that I think um, is something that's quite interesting to reflect on uh, we, we asked people um, who use OER whether they adapt resources to fit their needs. Um, by that, we meant something like, do you engage in the behaviors that you're enabled to do through open licensing, like remixing and reusing and, and so on? Um, and this came out at nearly 80%. I mean, in in one, one cohort, which was the non-formal students, that was as high as 85%. So there's an interesting question there about, oh, well, did, did they mean the same thing that we meant by adaptation? Um, Possibly they meant I just took something and made it fit, you know, with what, with what I needed it uh, for. Um, it's often said that low cost is the reason that people use OER. We didn't find much support for that. Um, I think freely available online was probably a more significant um, element. Um, and when you look at the number of uh, learners who are not registered for a course of study, but say they're using OER, that was as high as 75 percent. But you might say uh, at this point, well, you know, what's OER uh, in a way? Does it have to be the stuff that's in an OER repository or that's designed to be used as OER? Um, we found that a lot of people, especially teachers, are actually using OER um, for a, a, quite a wide variety of reasons. It could be just to brush up on something quickly re reading Wikipedia. It could be that they're planning a lesson and um, looking for inspiration for something, you know, a new angle they can take on it. They're very unlikely to actually type OER into a search engine, but they're looking online for materials that are freely available all the time. Um, and learners and, and, and educators are both doing this. Um, one of the things we're interested in at the Open University is the extent to which um, people can be uh, encouraged into um, formal study through the use of um, open educational resources and um, the OU has uh, the Open Learn platform which is the big OER repository there. Um, 
you get an interesting sort of polarization around this. People who've used these kind of resources, uh, roughly say 20% say it makes them more likely to go on to formal study. About 20% say it makes them less likely. Now you can interpret that in terms of um, a sort of quality issue. Um, but it's not, maybe not so much that as people having their learning needs met by what they're finding for free online and not feeling any need to go to any extra sort of level with that. Um, this is not my uh, graphic, this is um, someone else's, there's a citation on the side. Um, but I thought it might give you um, a sense of how um, there's lots of different elements to all this and different things that are, that are happening and different layers to all this. Um, when we talk about something like impact, what we imply is a kind of nice, neat, causal relationship. So we did A and B happened. Um, but obviously, these things are much more complicated than that. And um, furthermore, I'd want to say, I suppose, that um, most of the time, impact is contextual. So the difference it makes is dependent on what the context is like. Um, and I would, I'd be tempted to sort of frame this in terms of openness itself being, um, being basically directed toward removing barriers and, in, and increasing freedom and increasing people's um, autonomy. So the more free you are, there's lots of different ways that you could realize that. So it's quite hard to say, well, this is the result that will happen if you introduce OER. Um, in some cases, um, the priority is more to do with, if you like, not really changing the way people uh, teach and learn, but doing the same thing with open resources. So rather than using proprietary materials, they might um, start using um, a, fr a free or open textbook. This is a big thing in the USA where um, the, the cost of textbooks can be huge. Um, <clears throat> other communities are more interested in the, if you like, more kind of revolutionary aspects or more radical aspects of this, which lets people take more control over what they're doing and how they're teaching and how they're learning. Um, but I suppose I'd want to also sort of offer the, the caveat to that, that, um, that you still need to be able to um, be a good learner to access a lot of this stuff openly even if you're an educator who's interested in using it. There are certain skills around it, and partly they're skills like this, uh, sorry, they're, they're conditions like access and accessibility, do you have an internet connection, can you use a computer, and so on. Um, but it's also things like, do you have the confidence and the mindset, um, do you have the right language skills, the right kind of time management skills, the right digital and critical literacies and these kind of things. So even in an area like uh, medical education where obviously quality is paramount, there can still be a role for OER in supporting these kind of secondary skills and the sort of culture of learning that's, um, that's desirable, I would say. So, um, so yeah, I think, that's, I think I should stop because otherwise I could go on for a long time. So, um, Thanks for listening, and I'll take any, any questions that, that you have. Um, the slides are there for anyone who wants to um, have, have a look through, and there's some links on there to follow. Um, at the end here, you can see um, I've given um, links for another couple of open education research groups, the Open Education Group in the USA and the War 4D project, um, plus a bunch of links where you can check out more stuff from OER Hub. We have a long list of publications if you want to find out some of the nitty gritty details. Um, and uh, yeah, get in touch if you have any questions. Okay. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, that was so interesting. I'm just going to take control back. <clears throat> yeah, thank you so much. OER Research Hub is doing such interesting work. and so many areas and with such a small team. I don't know. I don't know how you're doing it. <laughs> um, and, that was, <laughs> yeah. and that was a really interesting point you made at the end about the need for OER users to have good learner skills as well. That was um, something we're definitely starting to think yeah, about here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I've, we have a question in from Lindsay Sundrum, which is for you, Rob, and that is, um, are there any GOGN members in Malaysia? Um, is it only open, and is it only open to PhD researchers and alumni? Thank you. So I don't know off the top of my head if we've got anyone in Malaysia. Um, I can check and let you know. Um, we do accept people who are not necessarily doing a PhD. 
and there are different levels of membership as well. So um, you, anyone can join just as an associate. So anyone who's just interested in that in that area and wants to stay in touch with the project. Um, but um, we have some master's students who are thinking about going on to doctoral study, for instance. Um, uh, so you could definitely join. It's just a question of what um, specific role you'd want to join as. Um, it might be easiest to join as an associate first, then you get all the emails and everything, and then um, uh, you'd have access to the group and you'd have access to the to the staff to talk about where you might want to go with it next. Um, so yeah, just just uh, get in touch through the website and and uh, go from there. Thanks, Rob. And actually, I, I'm a, I'm an associate member. I think recently after finding you, and um, it's it's been a very interesting. There's good emails, uh, Lindsay. I, I if you're interested, I recommend it. It's a very good resource. Um, so I think I have a couple of questions actually um, for both of you. So I'll I'll ask both questions and then I'll hand it, the mic to Daksha and give Rob a little time to think about his answers. So. Um, my first question is, which of the reported findings from the impact studies, the benefits and the challenges, did you find the most um, surprising or inspiring? Which one really made you think, oh, I didn't, I didn't expect to see that? And the second question is a bit more woolly, and it's about this um, idea of community of users. How important do you feel the community of users is for generating sort of long-term and sustainable impact from OER use. I hope, that's, hope that makes sense. <laughs> Daksha? Um, thanks, Sally. Well, I guess when we first did the um, pilot study, we were, we were going into territory that was totally unknown to us. And what did surprise me was the number of people who had never done an online course before. And um, it, it made me, and what the level of satisfaction they got out of that new experience. So it kind of uh, was a breakthrough into a completely new medium of education that had not been explored in eye care particularly. So for that reason, I thought that stood out. Uh, as the big flag from which we now went on to develop a lot more of the online content uh, and using the open education principle. And the second point that, that um, you raised, the importance of community of OER users. And the way we're going about this is that it's, it's important to have this community. And particularly, we want to link that community with the body of experts that we have in our subject area. So it's, it's a very specific and strategic approach to enhance our community through the educators who can directly influence and shape the curriculum. So I guess, yes, the community is very important. And, and it allows us both a, a top-down and a bottom-up approach. So, of course, we've got the curriculum with its accreditation uh, and the educators. But then at, from a bottom down, it's the users and how they're sharing that content with their own teams. And that creating that whole network is, is the way forward, we think, to strengthen ICA education. Thank you, Tasha. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, Rob? Yeah, so... Um, a couple of things, I suppose, um, as examples of potentially surprising findings. Um, firstly, I would say there's a kind of contradiction between um, the professed beliefs and the behaviors of people who um, sort of advocate for open educational resources. So what I mean by that is um, when you ask people, um, do you believe that you should be um, publishing your resources uh, in an OER repository on a Creative Commons license and doing it all by the book, so to speak. Um, about about two thirds agree with that. But when it comes to um, do you actually do that, we've got about 12%, something like that. So lots of people think they should be doing it, but they don't do it. Um, and that's quite an interesting um, sort of finding to me because partly that's an interesting thing anyway, that contradiction. Um, but also, uh, if you know, 
you can imagine that there were this, these kind of um, these kind of cohorts of very committed open education um, advocates who were just doing everything the way that they should. But most people are actually just kind of online looking for stuff, and if it's useful, they use it, and they're maybe a bit worried about what they can and can't share, and sort of um, uh, in risk of violating copyright. So that kind of contradiction in in between belief and, and behavior, I find quite interesting. Um, another example that surprised me, I suppose, was um, when it came to so some of the work I did was looking at um, policy and um, OER policies that were, if you like, supposedly springing up um, to support this kind of growing OER movement. It actually turned out to be really hard to find examples of where there'd been some sort of piloting or, or um, innovation which has subsequently led to um, a, a policy being put in place in an institution to support OER. Um, and what it revealed was that actually a lot of this stuff is happening um, sort of below the radar and it's kind of informally shared and people are saying this is a useful resource but it's copyrighted so you know I'll, I can only share this much with you and I'll do it kind of privately on email and this kind of thing. So um, what I take from something like that is that people are just using stuff, you know, they're out there, they're, they're doing it already. Um, and um, most of the time they don't really care very much about what the license says on it. Um, but you know, in reality, the license is important because that's what gives you the, the legal protection. But the, the copyright laws that we have, and our, our, if you like, our, our sort of channels for disseminating information are based, you know, the, the legal frameworks are based in, you know, the, the 20th, if not the 19th century. So um, because we have this ability now to reproduce information anywhere in the world pretty much instantly and at marginal cost, so anywhere in the world, you know, not everywhere, um, but soon it will be everywhere. Um, you know, I don't think that our, our kind of frameworks have actually caught up with that kind of technical development. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would really strongly, I really agree with you there. That would be our experience as well. Mm. And in fact, we sometimes talk about whether talking about Creative Commons actually confuses people. And uh, this focus on copyright that we're forced into as institutions through copyright and IPR law is, is a real barrier. And so thinking about that um, from a kind of, going back to this idea of, well, you've got the people who just want to keep the system the way it is and replace all the textbooks with uh, open ones versus people who actually really want to change the way that it works. I think it goes back to that idea of copyright as a kind of instrument of control, effectively. Absolutely, yeah. And it's a sort of terms of our employment that we use it. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, it's embedded in. It's in there. Unfortunately, we c I could chat for hours as well. Unfortunately, we are out of time. So I'm going to have to stop the questions there. Thank you. Um, thank you first to both of our presenters. Um, oh, I'm trying to... Uh, but thank you both to Rob and Daksha for giving up your time to talk today. Um, two really interesting presentations. Um, here at ICH we very much want to thank our funders who make all of our work possible. And to let our uh, participants know that we are... Um, I hope you've enjoyed today and got useful information out of it and hopefully um, perhaps been inspired to look into OER and open education a bit more. And maybe even join us next time um, on March the 15th where we have a very practical session on finding and using open online courses which will be led by Joe Stroud who is our e-learning manager here at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And we'll also be talking a little bit more about this dreaded copyright issue um, with a member of our team, Astrid Leck, who's going to come along and talk about that. So um, thanks again, everyone. Um, I, I think I've covered everything, Dacha. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, Andy thank and you. Rob. And, uh, thank and you. To our yeah, take care, everyone. Thank Goodbye. Bye-bye. Cheers, bye-bye.